Hi folks, I'm Anthony with Two Guys in a Ride, and today we are here in Des Moines, Iowa. We're here at the Concord d'Elegance, and we're here with Randy. Randy has a pair of Chryslers behind us that have an, a fascinating story, and we've chased him from Minnesota down to Iowa to find him. Uh, so, Randy, first of all, thank you for spending your time with us today. Thank you. Tell us, tell us what we're looking at with both cars, and then tell us the story about how you got them. Well, okay. Well, first off, uh, the one we're standing in front of is a 1960 Chrysler 300F convertible. I'll explain that in a minute. The next one over is a 1957 Chrysler 300C coupe. Now, when I say F and C, Chrysler started uh, making what we call, now we call letter cars in 1955. They started, oddly enough, with the C300, which stood for Chrysler, and the 300 meant 300 horsepower. Okay. It was the first car that was standard factory issue that produced 300 horsepower in 1955. Then in 1956, it became the 300B, and in 57, the 300C, and then the D, and the E, and the F, and the G, and it went like that. They skipped I, okay. because they were afraid people would think that the I is a one. Okay. So they skipped over I, and they went all the way to L in 1965. Wow. And that's when the letter car series ended. But letter cars were Chrysler's very, very top of the line automobile and they put the biggest engines in the most luxurious interiors and that, that was you can put in there and top and, line stuff and we'll see that when we look at the interior of this 300f because it's it's just amazing what's in there yeah okay so i think if i remember correctly this was the first one you purchased or was it actually yes. it was yes. actually the f was the first one okay. i purchased so Tell us about that story. Well, the, one more interesting thing about the 300F convertible that this is, they Chrysler only made 248 of these originally. Really? So they were rare then and they're rarer now. now. I happen to own two of them, this black one and I have another one in Toreador Red that's just as beautiful. Wow. But anyway, so I first saw a car like this at Barrett Jackson in 2007. And I looked at it and I thought, that is the most beautiful car I've ever seen. And I asked the fellow sitting by it, I said, what is that? And he says, well, a 300F. And I went, oh, that's nice. I had no idea what he was talking about. But I thought, I got to get me one of those someday. <laughs> so I had to figure out what it was and where it, what, you know. So anyway, in 2008, I found one. And this was in Boston. And I flew out to Boston, looked it over and bought it from the guy. It needed restoration. Okay. It ran, but it was, it was in kind of rugged shape. Okay. So that was 2008 in July. So, okay. So anyway, so I had this car. I started restoring it in January of 2009. It took me nine years to complete this through okay. various restores. And I had my shares of problems with restores and the like. Anyway, okay. it shouldn't have taken that long, but it did. Uh, in the meantime, in January of 2010, a fellow in Texas called me up. Uh, and he said, hey, I've got this 300C, wondered if you'd be interested in buying it. So I said, well, yeah, send me some pictures and like that. And, and we came to a deal and I mailed him a check and I said, put it on a truck and send it up here. Well, when he did, well, when I, going back to this F, when I bought that, it came with an old title. Okay. An old title that dated back to 1962, showing the owner as a fellow named Harry D. Siena in Connecticut. Okay. Then when I bought the C, the fellow says, well, interesting, he goes, I've got an old title that goes with that car. And I said, okay, well, send me that, that'll be interesting. Well, I get a title, it's Harry D. Sienna from Connecticut, ah! the same guy. Are you serious? And what had happened through the years, Harry was an old guy that loved the Finn Chryslers and he mm -hmm. collected them to near bankruptcy. And he just collected them and he drove them until maybe they needed a tune-up or they didn't run right or something was wrong. And when something was wrong with it, he just put it in the barn and stored it away. And then he'd buy another one, and another one, and another one. And so uh, he had all these cars. Well, he grows old and dies and leaves them to his eldest son, Tommy. And Tommy keeps them and keeps them up. And, and then he 
got a disease of some sort, maybe cancer or something, and he dies. So then he passed him along to his younger brother, Richard. Okay. And Richard inherits the whole barn full of cars, but he needs money and he starts selling them off. So the first one to go, well, I don't know about the first in the collection, but of these two cars, the F was the first it's one sold. sold. Okay. And it went to somebody in Texas and then somebody in Ohio and some other people in between, and, and it ended up in Boston where I bought it. Okay. Uh, and then the C was sold later on uh, to a fellow in Texas. And then he's the guy that contacted me, and so I bought it from the guy in Texas. So these cars started out their life when they were bought brand new, basically under the same garage. Yeah, not actually brand new. I think Harry bought them in about... He was the second owner okay. of both of them. So he didn't buy either one brand new. He bought them as used cars. But it's safe to say that based on what you know about the timeline, these cars were in his collection at the same time. Yes. And, and these two were parked right next to each other in his barn for, what, 45 years or something like that? So so the cars are parked there. He buys them. Yep. They get eventually sold off yep. in separate states, separate directions. You buy the 300F by chance, without knowing anything about it, you get contacted about the 300C, buy it, and all of a sudden realize these are the sister cars that sat in the garage together. Yep, and they went around, and I ended you up. You couldn't with them. repeat that if you tried. And now they're back in. Now they're in my barn together they're, again. Yeah, they're what together so once again. My opinion is I'll never separate them. If I was to ever sell them, they somebody has to buy both, both of them, or of they're them. not for sale. Yes. Just, I, I mean, wow! You you couldn't try to repeat that if you planned it. <laughs> that is it's just amazing. awesome. All right, so let's, that is a great story. Let's talk about the 300F here for a minute. Okay. Tell us what's underneath the hood. Well, that's a 413 wedge head engine uh, that was introduced in 1959. So this would be the second year of the mm -hmm. 413. Those runners are called cross rams. So this has two four barrel carburetors, one at each side. And so the carburetor on the right feeds the left side of the engine and the carburetor on the left feeds the right side of the engine. So it's critical to get those tuned properly so they're both feeding the same amount of well, gas yes, and air into each side of the engine. So each one is a four barrel carb? <laughs> yes, and they're always feeding the engine so you have, so it gobbles a lot of gas. Yeah, it gobbles <laughs> a lot of gas, well sure. Do you know approximately how much horsepower? 375 is what the factory rated wow. it at, yes. Holy buck, because I assume a similar amount for torque, but... Yeah, the torque was like 490, I believe. Wow, yeah. holy buckets. I'm what, pretty what, close. What, what are we going to pull, a house? <laughs> Man. <laughs> well, and that's primarily what those, those cross rams, those runners, do, is they really increase torque, and maximum torque is at 2,800 RPM. So. Well... I, I mean, that's just amazing. This, you know, would it have been painted red from yes. the factory? Yes. So, I mean, when I restore them, I'm fussy about doing it just the way they was. came from the factory. And, and I've done everything possible that I can think of to make it as close to factory as, as it possible. could be. Yeah. I mean, and it just kind of goes to show, uh, I mean, the top of the line doesn't stop on the interior. I mean, the engine gets the color treatment, gets everything. Yeah. You got to get the right gloss levels, the right, you know, uh, um, the right color on each bolt, the gloss level, the you know, all those kind of things. The you know, details. Everything, just, yeah. Clamps, belts, hoses, all that screws, has to be bolts, yeah, yep. just so. Ah, well, it, it is a, <laughs> it's an amazing piece of artwork to, 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 to look at. Yeah. And it's got to be way more fun to sit in and drive it. It is fun. Yes, it's awesome. <laughs> Let's step around the side here. Uh, the interesting thing about this car is interior, well, the car as a whole is that, like I said, they only built 248 of these cars, so they're pretty rare. This car, this exact one, happened to be the very last one off the assembly line okay. in convertibles for 1960. So this one came off, they did five more hard tops, and then they closed the line down to set it up for the 1961 okay. models coming out very last convertible produced. As a result of that, the way car manufacturers do that is when they're ending a model year like that, they want to get rid of all the inventory on the shelf, so they load them up with every option there is. So this car ended up very highly optioned. It's got air conditioning, it's got 
power everything. Power seats, power windows, power locks, power antenna, power steering, power brakes. Uh, Man. All sorts of stuff. It's got a signal seeking radio. That's interesting. Really? There's a button on the floor, kind of like where the, the bright and dimmer switch would be. There's another button like that. Yep, I see it. And when you push that button with your foot, the tuner on the radio, the knob starts turning and it'll find a station and it'll stop. And then if you push the button again, it'll go to the next station and stop. You don't have to touch wow, the radio. I, that, I've never even <laughs> heard of that option before. That's cool. Man, I absolutely love the dashboard. Yeah. I mean, a half globe. Yeah. With with all the and then the the bazillion buttons and dials you have. Yeah, everybody loves buttons and dials and switches. Walk us through a few of them. That, would you? Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Well, here's as long as we're standing right here. Here's an interesting feature of this car too: is that it has six-way power swivel seats. Now that swivel seat was touted by Chrysler so a lady could maintain her dignity during ingress and egress. Also works good for slightly chubby fellows getting in and out. <laughs> now, four four chairs. Everybody gets their own seat, and everybody gets two armrests. These are, you know, storage consoles. Yep. Both on, of them. On both of them. Yeah. And then, of course, you have cigarette lighters and everything. Power that you window need switches and in the middle. Yeah. Man. Now, if we'll. This dash is called an Astra Dome, A-S-T-R-A Dome. Uh, that is electroluminescent so that when it lights up at night, there are no light bulbs in that dash. That's phosphorescent paint, and, it's, and there's a transformer under the dash that hits it with high voltage. And when you get this really high voltage going through that paint, those numerals and all that stuff glows at night, the most beautiful blue glow you've ever seen in your life. It's just it's interesting. Chrysler touted that as to reduce mm -hmm. eye strain because there's no glare from mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Wow. Now, and another unusual thing is does this have a push button transmission? Yeah, push button okay. transmission up on the left. Yeah. And then over on the right was uh, had to do with your climate? That has to do with air conditioning and vent and heater and that kind of stuff. Okay. And your RPM tack was in the center console. Yeah. Okay. Now, another unusual thing is the air vents. And we were talking about this earlier, yeah. Randy, but... I call, them, one. I call them turrets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Chrysler in their air conditioned cars would have those turrets so you could, you know, turn them and point them the direction you want them to go. It's always easy to tell a Chrysler air conditioned car of this era because it has those turrets. If there's no turrets and there's just a flat vent there, that means there's no air conditioning. Yeah, so you can tell without opening the hood. Yeah. It doesn't have a uh, turn signal uh, clicker switch like you'd expect on the steering column. It's, uh, the turn signals are here on the dash. Oops, little dent. Oh, there's nice. the uh, there's the turn signal left and right. Interesting. But it self cancels when you turn. It cancels itself and stuff like that. Oh, oh wow! Now that takes a little getting used to. Yes, it does. A lot of times I reach for the blinker and it ain't there. <laughs> now uh, the this the this must have been just on the 300F where they had this yeah. wheel. Yeah. Yeah, because on the next the next model down would be the New Yorker, and then that was just a uh, uh, a deck lid, and it had a couple of ribs on it. Okay, yeah. so this is but just no, like a beauty mark. There's no function to that. No function at all. No, okay, just for looks. Man, that uh, I, I just those boomerang lights are just beautiful. Oh my gosh. Okay, so again, tires, the bias ply. Yeah, these are bias ply. Yeah. Okay. Like I said, I'm a little nutty about making them just the right. way the factory radials don't belong in here. I get these cards judged. I like to compete nationally in AACA events, yep. Antique Automobile Club of America, where these cars get judged for craftsmanship and authenticity. Yeah, every, now, this car screw has is. gone all the way to AACA Senior Grand National is essentially the That's highest award you can win. Right. So, but you have to have bias ply tires or Oh, you, you, don't, can't, you can't win that kind of an award. <laughs> what advice would you have for somebody that's starting out in the classic car collections and has an interest in bringing their car back 
to, let's say, um, you know, concourse level? Well, I kind of always say all it takes is time and money. So it's about that simple. It, a lot more time than you would expect and a lot more money than you would expect. <laughs> so whatever you think it's going to cost, it's going to cost a lot more, more than that. Path. You got to open your wallet and let them fly. It's just the way it is. And, and, and you've been through a couple different restores, a couple I different sure things. Have. So, it, that, but that that's part of the world, right? You, 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 world. you make your best gamble, and the person you gambled on didn't work. Okay. So if you if you could knowing what you know, if you had to restart from scratch but you could retain the knowledge you had, would you do anything different? Like as far as the process you went through for the cars or. Forget cars, I'm going to boats or... No, I don't think so. No, I'm happy, you know. Yeah, with I, what you did, okay. This particular no, car took longer and cost far more than I ever expected, but I don't regret it. I I, I like to say the cars are more fun, fun than the money is. <laughs> yeah. Money is just money. I don't know. It sits in the bank. Who cares? <laughs> right. The, the, the other part of that equation is part of the part of the fun in getting into the car and driving it later is that journey. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you're kind of glad when it's over. Yeah. Yeah, you are. But you're like, you found that history. Fun of it is coming to car shows like this and uh, just meeting lots of people and... Uh, Gotta have friends all across the country now right. from just traveling to different car shows and events and things and you get to meeting and knowing people and it's just a great brotherhood and just a lot of fun. That's it just, is. Yeah. What's your favorite memory with either this car or its sister car? Oh I guess I guess the, the most exciting thing was when I got the titles for each of these cars and surprised to find out that the same felt learning the history of them to tell the story of you know these cars now in, in yes. starting on that I need to tell you some stuff about this 300c yes. which we haven't covered yet the fellow in Texas that bought this from Harry D. Sienna's collection he found it listed on Craigslist he was from Salina, Texas, and he wanted to buy it, and he told Richard, which was the youngest son that was now owning and selling this car, that he wanted to buy it, and he is going to hitch his trailer, and he goes to Connecticut to pick it up. Okay. He said he got to Connecticut and got there, and they were going to load it onto the trailer, and he said, and Richard was just crying his eyes out, and he was all heavily emotional because he's you know with dad's cars his brother's car mm -hmm. all his life all this stuff so he said he just started sobbing uncontrollably he just couldn't get a hold of himself he was just and he goes i can't sell it i can't do this i can't go through with it and this fellow from texas is like i'm here i came all of it you got it yeah and so he kind of waited and let him calm down a little bit and about the time it looked like they were going to make the deal happen the next door neighbor lady comes out of her house. Now, mind you, this is at midnight. Okay? She comes out and she cusses up a storm at Richard. What are you doing, you stupid asshole? How can you can't sell that car? I dated your brother in this car. We went to the movie oh, theater. No. We went, and she's like, you can't sell it. This is, you know. And she starts, and then they're both crying. And it's just, he said, it's just bedlam. It was just craziness. He said he was lucky that he said, I just loaded it onto the trailer and grabbed what I could out of there before oh. they changed their mind. Oh my gosh. But interesting about this also was that when Richard, now he's the youngest son again and he's the one selling it. Yep. When he was eight years old, his older brother Tommy drove him to the World's Fair in 1964. And Richard bought this sticker and stuck it in the back window. New York World's Fair 1964. It's still there. So when we restored the car we were careful to take that back glass out and polish the glass around it but leave that sticker in place because it's an important piece to the car. Oh my gosh. Now this that car also great. interestingly came with a uh, what's called a highway hi-fi. Yeah the record player. The record yeah. player. Yes. Yeah. I'll let him get on the other side here. We call it a record player, but Chrysler called it a highway hi-fi. Interesting is that that turntable, those records are about the size of a 45, but they're actually 16 and two-thirds RPM. So that turns very, very slowly. So even a record of that size will play for about 45 minutes wow. or so per side. That's interesting. 
Now, these were just offered in Chrysler only, and only actually offered in 1956 and into 57. Now, you'll see cars once in a while in 58 and stuff that have them because Chrysler ended up with lots of inventory that they, they were just putting them in cars. But anyway, Columbia made the records, and there was a whole set of records, 36 records you could buy with this car. And I have almost all of those records now. And we were talking, this was several, maybe even, may even have been last year, but going down the road with that plane, I said, well, how much does it skip? And you said the car floats so much, there's no, never any skipping. I'll tell you all kinds of lies about that. <laughs> I like to say, if you want to know if it skips, then buy the car and you find out. <laughs> there you go. I have no comment. All right. Now, uh, I, I love the emergency brake handle. I yeah. mean, it's just the way it's, it's made to look like everything else in here. Yeah. Uh, man. Great car, it's, leather interior. Yeah. Now, what's also interesting about this C compared to the F we just looked at, and I was telling you how that F is fully loaded with practically right. every factory option, this one has no options at all. This one was stripped down. Interesting on this is that what was standard was power windows and power seat was standard. This has neither. It has a manual seat and manual right. crank windows. It does. So somebody had to special order this and have them take that stuff off. Yeah. Very unusual. My take on it is somebody bought it for drag racing, I think, but I don't know. It's kind of funny. But this car has a heater, and that was an option. You had to order and pay extra for a heater. Sure. And then it has tinted glass, and you had to pay extra for tinted glass. So Interesting the combination to, to figure out. It's hard to figure out. I don't know, but... You know, leather interior. Maybe, maybe it was ordered and canceled, then ordered and canceled. And by the time they did that, they just said, we're putting this build together. You can have this if you want. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> okay, how about approximately how much horsepower? 375 is what the factory rated it at. Yeah. And torque? I don't know off the top of my head. It'd okay. be up in the 400 yeah, the somewhere. Of, yeah. Oh, man. But that was the engine that all the drag racers, the uh, the the rail cars in the 60s and stuff, they'd all seek out these it's 392 the Hemis because they go like, holy heck, you know. Oh, man. Well, Randy, thank you so much for spending your time with us today talking about the, the Chrysler 300F and the 300C. Both beautiful cars. I can't believe they're sisters and they got separated and reunited. But that is just an awesome story, and the cars are just absolutely stunning. Thank you. So thank you on behalf of those of us that don't get to see them every day for bringing them back to uh, showroom quality. Very good. Well, thank you, Nathan. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for sharing your story. We yeah. appreciate it. Thanks for watching.